Let me um, begin by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Jen Charteris. I'm speaking to you from the north of England. Uh, my husband is a, a church pastor in a place called Newcastle upon Tyne. Some of you will have heard of the football team. Uh, we are very far north in England, almost in Scotland. So just, just north of where I, where I live is where Scotland uh, starts. We've, we've lived here for the last 15 years. I'm originally from South Africa. Uh, that's where I, where I grew up. My parents were, were missionaries. That's where I went to school. Um, uh, but I've lived in the UK for about 32 years now. And most of that time, I have worked as a management consultant. I worked uh, with organizations uh, navigating particularly complex uh, leadership and organisational change challenge, uh, challenges. I work, I've worked a lot with with, with government, um, uh, the, the, the defence sector, um, big engineering projects, that that sort of thing. Um, and I've always come at that as a Christian person, and being a Christian person has always shaped and informed uh, my my approach to that. Um, but nowadays, I, I work as the exec director of a training organization called Crossens. Um, we, we provide in-context theological training for people uh, all over uh, the UK and Europe, um, people who would never be able to attend a residential seminary. We're able to provide flexible, flexible training. And one of the things I've enjoyed uh, about my role, sort of moving from uh, the, the leadership work I did uh, in, in the wider world to, 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 to working in a ministry organization is being able to, to, to be much more um, overtly biblical in the way that we uh, approach, approach things. So I hope, I hope that and pray that's always been the case in my, in my practice, but it's great to be able to be really, really overtly biblical about that. Now the, the, the territory we're going to cover this afternoon, we've called planning in uncertain times. And um, one of the things to say about this is um, this is um, the, the, the idea of how we lead through uncertainty and in particular our approach to planning uh, to take to keeping the organization moving forward intentionally and, and so on um, is in part uh, informed by research that's kind of come into the organizational leadership, leadership sphere from the complexity sciences. Um, there's some really, really helpful material. You don't need to worry about that too much, but if you're interested in that, I just wanted to kind of put that flag so you'll, you'll kind of recognize it when we, as, as we go through it. Um, it's, it's really, really helpful material. But one of the really exciting things for me is that um, as Christians, we have far more to bring to the navigation of uncertainty than, um, than, than, than anybody working uh, in, the, in the complexity sciences. So it, it gives us some useful stuff, but, the, 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 but a biblical worldview informs us uh, so much better. Uh, and so hopefully we're gonna, we're gonna bring those two things together as, as we go through uh, this, this afternoon. Uh, as I said earlier, there, there will be some breakout work uh, as as we go through this. So hopefully, opportunities to talk through the sort of some of the some of the issues and challenges that you face in your context. Um, so uh, it'd be be helpful if um, you can sort of stay logged on through the afternoon. We will have some breaks, but if you stay logged on, you'll stay allocated to the same group. I think that's all I need to say. Um, by way of uh, introduction this, this afternoon. So let me get underway and just sort of set up um, the, the, the initial um, kind of constructs that we're going to think about. Now, uh, hopefully, there we go. I hope that you can see my desktop uh, there. Um, one other thing, sorry, I should have said by way of introduction that there will be, we'll, we'll, we'll dip into some questions and so on from time to time. So please feel free. Uh, to use the chat function if you would like to do that um, as a way of, um, of, of um, logging questions as, as we go through them. And uh, we, can, we can take some time out to pick it up on some of those, those more detailed questions. One thing to say as we start thinking about um, how, we, how we plan, how we, how we um, take an organization forward um, is that planning, in particular how we plan, is, uh, in my view, a profoundly theological activity. It certainly is for us as Christian believers, because what happens when we are planning things uh, in an organization, trying to develop strategies and ways forward, is that it, um, it exposes our 
our, our, our assumptions, our desires, our perspectives on the work, on the work that we do, on the world that we uh, inhabit, on on our roles, on the people that we serve, and and, and so on. So, you know, just just our, our our doctrine of God, our doctrine of humanity, and so on, all is is informing and shaping uh, how we how we lead, how we plan, uh, and and so on. So let's let's bear that in mind. What we're going to cover, um, I'm going to talk begin by just setting up some concepts. Um, we're going to talk a bit about the dynamics of uncertainty. And uh, one of the things I want to highlight um, in, in a couple of different ways is that um, essentially uncertainty, although many of us as human beings don't love it, um, is actually not all bad. And there are significant upsides to uncertainty. And we'll think about that. I'm going to use a, a concept called the ladder of abstraction to remind ourselves that actually not everything is uncertain either. And I hope that will prove helpful to you. And then I'm going to introduce a concept of polarities and I'll explain more about that, that what, what we mean by that. But exploring some important and valuable tensions that we're often dealing with, particularly in times of uncertainty and complexity, and how we can work well with those rather than be um, derailed by them uh, as leaders. And then we'll cover some further, some, some other particular principles and tools uh, for planning in uncertainty. Um, we're gonna think about some communication uh, principles uh, as well before we finish. And then finally, I want us to, to, to wrap up by thinking through how we lead, what's our posture um, and, and, and approach as leaders in times of uncertainty. So uh, I hope and trust that's all going to be fruitful. Um, one of the things I said uh, much earlier on was um, that as Christians, we are uh, better equipped than, than, than anybody. We should be better equipped than anybody to cope with um, uncertainty, with the unexpected uh, and, and so on. And let me, let me uh, dive into um, into the Acts, uh, the Book of Acts, uh, to as as a way to illustrate uh, this and to start looking at the patterns. Actually, I could have gone almost anywhere in Acts uh, to think about this. I've I've landed on on looking at Acts uh, chapter eleven uh, in 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 Antioch. So let me just read this uh, through through for us. You, you you've got it on the screen, but I'll read it through as well. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed uh, had traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch, spreading the word amongst only Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were taught to, were brought to the Lord. And then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch and so for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. And the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. So let's just, um, there, there, there are a number of things we could, we could dig into here, but a few, a few threads I just wanted to, to highlight uh, as, as, as we go through this. So um, first of all, what we've got going on here is a really significant rupture happens. This was in nobody's strategic plan. Nobody had a five-year plan that said, we're going to send everybody out um, across the known world. Um, it was a really, really adverse circumstance. Uh, Stephen has been killed. Persecution has broken out. Nobody planned this. Um, and, and so people are scattered. Um, uh, and 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 just just totally unexpected circumstances, and yet people keep on uh, doing some of the things that uh, they most importantly need to do, and so what you have going on, uh, which which I could kind of describe as a muddling through, is they they kind of rec recognizing um, that they that 
there are some vital few things. We, you know, we didn't expect this, we didn't anticipate this, but there are some vital things that we need to keep doing. Uh, they keep on spreading the word among the Jews, and then they begin to, to, to speak to, 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 to Greeks also. They're sharing the word of the Lord. That, that, that's, that's the key thing that has to keep being done. Um, news, of, news of that reaches the church in Jerusalem. Goodness, what's happening? Uh, we're, we're, uh, until now, we thought that the gospel was for Jews, and all of a sudden we're seeing these, these non-Jews uh, come, come to faith. Um, what, what on earth do we do? So they send Barnabas uh, to, to Antioch um, and, and Barnabas goes and sort of fi finds out more. So instead of a, a sort of strong reaction, they, they go and find out more. Um, and, and Barnabas's response is to take a look at what's going on um, uh, and just really focuses them on what's the most important thing to do? Remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. There's a, there's a kind of really simple principle that he, he, he focuses uh, in on. He doesn't start giving rules or, or, or anything else. He, he just very simply uh, explains that the key thing they need to do, encourages them to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. And I'll explain why I've used that term simple rules uh, later on. And then, and then he goes off and finds Paul and as, uh, Saul comes back and they meet with the church and teach them in great numbers of people. Now, um, I've deliberately kind of pulled out a bit of a, a, a pattern that we, we, we see in there. But the most important thing in all of this is that the Lord's hand uh, was, was with them. Uh, so in, in, all this, in, in all this sort of unexpected, undesirable, seemingly undesirable circumstance, um, we, we, we are reminded that God is sovereign in that uncertainty. And so all of these things uh, going on actually turn out to be uh, for the blessing of the kingdom, for the sake of the kingdom, for the extension of God's kingdom. And as, as Christian believers, the knowledge that God is sovereign, that none of this is happening outside of his will and control and, and, and purposes, is the most extraordinary baseline for us to be working from as leaders, um, as we as we think about uh, how we how we navigate uh, uncertainty and how how we cope with it and plan as best we can uh, with, within it. But that little that little pattern that I've drawn out in the in the in the little speech bubbles on on the side. Uh, if you just step back for a moment and think through the year that you've had, uh, how how you have coped with various things or the uncertainty that you're dealing with now. I wonder whether you see elements of that pattern in, in, your, in your situation. That's, that's certainly um, something that, that looks very, very close to home for, for, for me and my organization, for many of the pastors and other Christian leaders uh, that, that I deal with. Something comes along um, as we've had globally this, this, this year, this, this, this great big rupture happens and we kind of go, what are the vital few things that we've got to keep going? And then we sort of make sense of it as, and we become very alert to all the things that, that you know, and, and try to work out and, 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 and see what's happening. And then as a principle to say, what are, the, what are the key things we want to keep reminding people to do and keep going uh, despite all of this disruption? Uh, and then thinking about, how we continue to equip and encourage. So I think that you know, what, what Acts 11 and many other of the, of the kind of incidents that unfold through Acts, you'll see that kind of, that, that kind of pattern there, uh, which I think is very helpful to, to us. The dynamics of um, complexity and uncertainty, I think are very helpful to think about. And for a, a ministry, an organization, whether you're a church leader or it's a leader of some other kind of uh, organization, um, I think it might resonate with you to, to think through how um, over time your situation changes in terms of two particular dynamics that I want to draw attention to. The first is how certain or uncertain things are. So whether um, whether your environment and your organization is close to certainty, and there's a reason I'm using a slightly odd um, kind of phraseology here, you know, are things close to certainty, like predictable, you know, things are in a pattern that we understand and we, we, we feel we can anticipate, um, or are we far away from certainty? But that interplays with another dynamic that's usually going on as well, 
which is uh, how close to agreement or far from agreement we are as, as an organization within our, within our community. So down at the bottom uh, left-hand side where you've got things are pretty close to certainty where they're, they're fairly sort of predictable and, and running as we expect them to, uh, and things are close to agreement, people are of one mind and so on. Then we've got kind of business as usual. That's, that's where things are happening in a sort of fairly conventional way. If we move out a little, a little way, things become a bit more complex. So we're not as certain things are a little bit, um, a little bit less predictable than they, they were. Uh, and, and people are perhaps less aligned, less clearly aligned than, than perhaps we, we, we had, had been used to, then they become more complicated. Um, of course, if you, um, uh, you, if you end up with um, losing agreement in an organization, and some of you will have experienced that as leaders, you might sort of end up with quite a politicized environment where you're trying to get things done and you have to sort of really work hard to influence people, get people on board and, and, and coerce them and so on. I think a really interesting thing happened um, a year and a bit ago when uh, the pandemic hit us and you, you will have had other situations perhaps of a different order um, in, in your organizations, which is um, suddenly we lost certainty. We suddenly moved to this massive degree of, of uncertainty, hugely unscripted. Nobody, nobody knew what the rules were um, or how this would play out. But one of the interesting dynamics in that is that for a short time in the early stages of a crisis, Actually, we were quite. We, we we moved closer to agreement for a short time. In the moment of a crisis, leaders will often have um, more permission than usual to sort of to, to to be quite directive, to take command. We want we want leaders who are going to be decisive, um, and we'll all sort of gather gather around, and we 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 all agree um, to our freedoms being curtailed because we, we're full of fear and anxiety and, 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 and uncertainty. And so for a short time in that moment of crisis, you actually get the sudden increase in uh, agreement. You're closer to agreement uh, than perhaps you even were before. But over time, it can spin out into chaos. And um, you know, some, some, of our, some of our communities and societies have seen that where, where actually the, the, the initial um, cohesion that came together at the start um, dissipates very, very quickly and you kind of spin out into, into massive disagreement uh, and actually that adds to the, the uncertainty and so on. But mo for the most part, uh, many of us have found ourselves dwelling in what I call the, the zone of complexity um, and sometimes it's called the edge, of, the edge of chaos or another word that is used uh, about it is uh, to describe it as being um, uh, bounded, uh, bounded uncertainty, bounded instability. Sorry, so where where things are are kind of moving around between certainty and agreement, and and and, and so on. And I don't know about you, but I certainly recognise that for lots of our organisations and communities in in my context. Now there are a few things that we can say uh, here about um, uh, how how we how we operate in in this space. One is that. Um, I think in all, although we like to think that um, things are predictable and that we're all in agreement, in fact, we're never as close to agreement or to certainty as we think we are. Um, second of all, um, I think we, we often find that a loss of certainty, as we've all experienced recently, um, will often expose differences that were hidden. And so we've had huge protests in, in, in many parts of the world, many communities um, exposing fundamental differences that we, we kind of, we, we muddled along with uh, previously, but in the fear of the, of, of, of the greater uncertainty, those, those differences become uh, exaggerated and more concerning. Um, and then similarly, you get into a bit of a cycle where loss of agreement uh, will give rise to new uncertainty. So, so the more um, disparity you get in opinions and perspectives and so on, actually, the more disruptive that becomes uh, and, and so on. And so you get into, into a cycle. But there's also something more positive uh, to say about this, which is um, the question, you know, sorry, 
more, more positive to say about this, let me just go back, back a step, which is that in that zone of complexity over there, um, sorry, I'm pointing at the wrong slide. <laughs> in, in that zone of complexity over there, there is enormous potential for creativity and innovation. So uh, those who specialize in innovation will say that actually this is the place where, where new potential emerges, the greatest kind of potential to, to generate uh, new possibilities, uh, new ways of doing things uh, emerges in this kind of zone of complexity. So that's the, 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 that very high potential uh, aspect. And so the, you know, the question that we're all kind of wrestling with is how do we plan and lead when things are truly complex? There's also a big leadership question that says when we're in this zone of complexity, um, how as leaders do we maintain a degree of cohesion uh, even when we can't be, be certain or, 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 or rely on high levels um, of agreement? So just, just in relation to this and sort of the idea that um, in, the, um, in the spirit of sort of gradually building up uh, a picture here, let me, let me add another, another layer or, or, or dimension um, as we think about um, broadly uh, different ways of approaching planning or strategy uh, and, and, and so on. So um, we, there, there are broadly two ways that people um, or organizations or groups of people approach how we plan and how, how we develop strategy. One is to be very kind of long term planned. Um, you know, we, we, we kind of we look a long way in, in advance and, and, and look ahead. And the other is to be very emergent, very responsive, reflective, uh, very, very iterative about it. That can in part depend on the type of sector uh, that we're in, uh, the type of culture that we're part of, and the personality of, of a leader can, can make a, a, big, a big difference to that. But both of those are um, have, have validity, they both of those have legitimacy. Um, but if you're really accustomed to one or the other, then the alternative can seem can seem difficult and, and, and challenging. But really, um, having an interplay between those two is probably what I've seen as, as being, uh, you know, the, the most kind of healthy way that, that, that successful organizations work over time. So acknowledging that there is this interplay between needing to be very, very planned and needing to be very, very emergent um, uh, and, to, and to be consciously sort of ensuring that both of those processes and both of those stances uh, towards to, to, towards um, um, planning and being being strategic uh, um, you know, are present uh, in the in the organisation's um, patterns and, and culture and norms and, and and so on. Now, that's generally relevant, but it's also an example of a concept I wanted to then introduce into the conversation uh, here, which is the con the, the concept of polarities. So the idea of polarities is um, what a polarity is, is something that um, a, a pair of opposites that seem to be kind of opposing to, to one another or, or are kind of completely contrasting to, to one another, but where we need both um, for the system to be, to be healthy. So I've put up on this, the screen uh, a little example here of one polarity, which is activity and rest. So all of us, all of us know this for ourselves. My, um, I, you know, could could run a little case study on um, my 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 father who who died a number of years ago, but um, my 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 father had a very strong bias towards uh, rest over activity, um, and so actually that that imbalance became very very unhealthy. Whereas I have another friend whose um, imbalance is very, very strongly towards activity and never resting, and actually as a result becomes uh, very, very unhealthy. And so you can see, like the two sides of a magnet or a, or a battery or something like that, these, these things that are opposite, actually the, the health and the, 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 the potential comes from the, the, a, a good interaction and a good strong presence of both of those things. So we could we could run a bit of an example here and go, you know, there, there are some real upsides of activity. Um, and if, if, we, if we were all in the same room here together together here, we could do a great little exercise around this. But you know, if I'm 
if, if, if I have a good level of activity, then I'm likely to be um, fairly healthy uh, and I'm probably likely to be well engaged socially uh, with people. I will be productive, I will get things done and, and I, I will be growing as a, as, a, as a human being. But if I overdo activity at the expense of rest, um, then I become uh, exhausted, um, ineffective uh, and so on. And so the, the antidote to that would be to rest. Um, and so and so there are real upsides to rest. Um, you know, if I if I take enough time to rest, then um, my, 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 my mind is refreshed, my body is refreshed, my relationships are often refreshed, uh, and, and so on. But if, like my dear departed father, um, you overdo the rest at the expense of the activity, um, actually you become very unhealthy um, and, 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 and potentially actually cut off from relationships because you're just not out and about and uh, you're not actually able to achieve uh, the things that you really want to achieve and so on. And so the antidote to overdoing the rest is to build in more activity. And so that's, a, that's just a, a really simple uh, kind of everyday example of a concept that um, I have found in, in the work that I've done with, with teams wrestling with, um, with, with, with complex issues and, and uncertainty and so on, a really, really helpful kind of frame for, for thinking about certain aspects of, of what, what comes up. So here, here are some other important um, tensions uh, that you, you, you might um, notice. And these become, I think, particularly important at, at times of uncertainty. Going back to that question about, you know, so what, what, what to do? So for example, um, when things are very uncertainty, uh, when, when, when things are very uncertain, having a healthy balance, a good balance between action and reflection, we need to do some things, we have to act um, because we have a responsibility to, to act and respond. But equally important that we're not running around like crazy people that taking take but, but but rather take time to reflect as well and so we need this healthy balance of action and reflection um, similarly uh, you know we many of us will have found ourselves dealing with questions of safety and risk and and, and that, you know it's sort of organizational safety psychological safety physical safety um, and, and and risk so you know how, how far can we can we go on this if we, if we only keep everything completely safe and never take any risks, we actually sort of stop living, which is actually the most risky thing you can do. And so those two things have to both be present and kept in some dynamic balance uh, over, over time. As leaders, we've perhaps had to really think about, on the one hand, needing to demonstrate confidence so that people have uh, and an ability to, 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 to trust us and get behind us when things are uncertain. Uh, and at the same time, we have to have a lot of humility about the fact that we just don't know uh, all, all the answers um, and, and so on. So I, you know, I could keep going through, 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 this, through this list and we've had to act fast and we've had to take things slow <clears throat> and so on. So one of the one of one of the reasons for for, for introducing this as a framework as, as, as part of this is it's First of all, it's a very, very liberating and helpful thing to see the polarities. So quite often a lot of, you know, a lot of tensions arise over, for instance, safety and risk in a, in a, in a community, in a church, in a ministry, what, or an organization. Uh, tensions will, will emerge very quickly about, you know, we, we, sh we should be taking more safety measures, or we should be taking more risks. And to, to just be able to name, to label the polarity and say these things are both valuable is just an enormously helpful starting point for a leadership team for sort of navigating. Um, and then to recognize that they need active maintenance. So over time, we've, you know, we, we can't sort of set them and leave them. We've got to keep managing them. So you know, perhaps things have become a bit risky and we just need to take slightly more you know, cautious approaches on certain things. Or actually, we've become so cautious that we've got to rebalance with, with being willing to take a little bit of risk. And so, part of our leadership task um, is so is 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 paying close attention to the the interaction and balance of of these kinds of polarities. Um, so, I hope I hope that resonates you with with you. Um, 
in a, in a couple of ways this afternoon, what, what, um, both both with the, the the grid I started off with on the, the 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 certainty agreement thing and with this and some other things, actually a huge step forward comes from actually having language and constructs frameworks to talk about uh, what's going on. There is more. We'll come we'll come on to adding more into that, but just being able to talk about some of these. Uh, is is very very helpful. In a moment, we're going to think a little bit more about uh, some of those polarities in our groups. But I, I've I've got these slides out of order. But I just wanted to show this to you. This this comes from I think the reference is actually on an earlier slide. But um, there's some very good work done by uh, a researcher called Barry Johnson on polarities. You, and there, there are other versions of this that other other people have have done. But uh, he he comes up he he has kind of set this out as as a framework for. Um, steps to managing a polarity well over time. Um, and the, the step, step number one is, first of all, to actually label the, the polarity. So being able to state very clearly the two sides of, of, of what we're trying to, to, to balance and keep, in, keep in, in, in healthy interaction. So activity and rest or safety and risk uh, and so on. One rule of thumb for, for, for labeling a polarity is that both sides should equally have positive potential. Um, so you know they, they could both have uh, value if if they're in the right if they're in the right relationship to to one another. So naming the polarity, the two halves of it, if you like, the two the two facets faces of it, um, is 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 step number one. Step number two then is to take uh, some some time to think about. Um, what are the upsides um, of this, this poll? So on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, what is the value that comes from focusing on that side? What's the value that comes from focusing on activity? What's the value that comes from focusing uh, on rest? And if we do those, both of those things really well, what's the, what's the kind of real Greater purpose. Barry Johnson talks about great, greater purpose statement. What's the, what's the real result if we do those things well? The the, the 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 kind of great outcome that we could get to naming naming that is valuable. And then thinking through for each side, um, what what are the fears? What are the negative results that might come from over focus on this to the neglect of the other? And then again on the on the right hand side. What are the what are the things that could result if we over focus on the right hand side to to the neglect of, of the left, and again this this kind of um, vicious cycle. What what what's the what's the kind of deeper fear from 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 lack of balance? So in my activity rest example, the sort of greater purpose of having good activity, good 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 rest, might be a, a, fr a fruitful life that blesses others, um, and and ultimately to to, to glorify God. And the deeper fear, if I get those wrong, if I, if I, if I, if they, if they completely, um, if if one completely outbalances the other, is that um, wh whether it's whether it's too much activity and driving myself into the ground, or too much rest and becoming ill, actually death <laughs> is perhaps the sort of ultimate. Just to just to be a bit stark about it. But then you start to get practical around those to say. Um, what are the action steps that will help you gain or maintain um, the, 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 the positive results from the upside, from, from, from that side? And what are the positive steps that you can take to, to get the results um, from, from that side? Um, uh, you know, on, uh, for, for rest, making, you know, managing, managing sleep and managing a day, ensuring days off and being accountable and all that sort of thing on activity, you know, having good, good plans and exercise and various, various other things. Great. Uh, let me let me take you then through and in, introduce you to an, an, another layer of thinking. Um, this slide um, reflects it's a summary of um, some some research by um, a researcher called uh, Keith Grint, Professor Keith Grint, who wrote about and, and identified the concept of wicked issues. Now he's not using wicked in the um, kind of moral sense that we would. Think about them as as Christians and the way the Bible describes them. But wicked issues are um, the the sort of problems that um, don't actually have um, in, or sort of potentially almost unsolvable. But we do have. But we have to kind of work out a way forward. We have to keep navigating uh, through them. And uh, what I've drawn out from um, a piece of work uh, that that he that that he published. 
um, were some of the, the principles um, that he, he felt were important for leaders to adopt when trying to sort of navigate through um, particularly wicked issues or uncertain territory uh, where you couldn't really uh, know the answer with or, or the right way to act uh, with, 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 with any absolute confidence and certainty. And I just want to pull out a few, a few of these, these things. Some of them require, some of them are self-evident and you've got them in the pack there. Actually, this, I think this might not be in your pack. I think I might have added this a bit later on. But um, this idea of negative capability, I think is a really, really interesting one. It's about the ability to not do something, to not act too quickly. Now, we don't always have that luxury. But sometimes um, when, when, when we really, when we're faced with really uncharted territory where things are highly uncertain and unpredictable, actually the ability to, to stand back initially and not rush into action, not try to be the hero, not try to sort of solve everything can actually be at times really, really valuable. So taking time therefore, to ask questions before we we have to before we try and sort of stand up and, and know the answers and most important and i'm going to come on to some techniques for doing this in a moment it's learning how to become good at working with collective intelligence not relying on individual genius um, how how we how we draw together the, the the kind of wisdom of all of those involved in a situation who will have different parts of um, the answer or different different perspectives on how to move how to move forward, and so although in some senses it's much much easier to to sort of um, to, to to act as a as a solo leader, in fact acting collectively um, and collaborating with others to figure out possibilities to figure out possible ways forward. Um, rather than relying on the kind of individual hero or, or genius solution um, is, is, um, is shown to be uh, over time a very a, a wise strategy. And that means we need to be paying, as leaders, we need to be paying attention to relationships more um, or more, more, more rigorously than we, than we sort of worry about uh, formalities of structure and, and so on, taking time to reflect before we act. And then this, this third from the bottom one I really, really like, is um, how do we foster a culture and an environment of constructive dissent, constructive disagreement, rather than destructive consent? So where we um, where we pressurize people to sort of sign up to a course of action when things are very uncertain, it's very unlikely to be um, strong, you know, confident agreement. People are often concerned; they ha they have concerns and and, and so on. Now. If you can actually foster an environment where people are able to express what their fears or reservations or alternative perspectives on an issue might be, actually what you're doing is gathering a great deal more uh, information, insight, uh, wisdom and intelligence on, on the issue. Um, and so that's what that's what's meant by this idea of, of constructive dissent, not destructive consent. And again, I'm going to come on to some of the some of the kind of tools and techniques specifically for, for that in a, in a moment. Um, and then he also highlights the need to try and identify and understand what he labels as positive deviance. Some of you will have come across this concept of positive deviance before. But it's the idea that, for, for example, and I think it's quite, quite well known in the aid world, uh, for instance, so if, for example, you have um, in a particular context a lot of malnourished children, and yet there is, there is, there, there is a, some subset of children who are not suffering from malnutrition, actually understanding why you've got that deviance you know, what what is what is the kind of positive deviance that wh where is that difference coming from and so sort of looking for as as a leader looking for for examples of well in this in this uncharted world what are some of the things that are working and how can we understand those better um, and 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 work out how we might make more of of them and get them to happen more of the time or more consistently uh, and and so so forth. Some of you might have come across the concept of appreciative inquiry. Uh, if you want, if you're interested, you can go, you can go and have a look. Appreciative inquiry is is a similar idea. It's it's a it's an approach to asking the question of when this is actually working or when things are going well, what what is happening there? And so so getting getting curious um, about things that think things that are actually uh, kind of 
succeeding in the context where you don't understand everything that's that's going on and all of that requires a, a huge degree of, of, of empathy and so on so it, one way to summarize all of this um, all of what i've just described on that previous slide is is to adopt a posture of not knowing it's a really interesting for a uh, kind of approach for many of us in the west where many of us have come into leadership and be valued for and got to where wherever we are in positions of responsibility or influence because of what we know we you know we, we we become quite expert in our fields and all of that sort of thing and all of that is of great value but in the in in in, in the face of, of great uncertainty and not knowing what to do actually taking a taking a kind of positive posture towards not knowing um is is a really really interesting approach for us to have and what we're tapping into there is, in a sense, the power of being awake and alert and curious. If I, if I kind of feel like I have to know the answer, I'm putting myself under pressure to reach conclusions about a thing that I don't understand. And I'm trying to reach conclusions about that thing often too soon, too quickly before I've understood it sufficiently. Whereas if I have this kind of posture of saying, um, actually, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of going to live in a state of not knowing very actively uh, for for a period of time then what that's going to do is make me ask more questions it's going to help me find more information it's going to help me seek out people who can speak into the situation we had a, a bit of a conversation earlier on in the session about you know often often the problem is not understanding a thing um, um more, more than the thing itself being inherently um uh, un, un, uncertain or un, unpredictable so um so so i think that's a um, oh, uh, something happened with my slide there. So in relation to that, but that's not a free for all. That's not just a, a kind of you know wild space where where, where there's 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 no purpose or or direction of of activity. In 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 taking that approach, what we do need to do is define clear aims and clear boundaries. So where where do we eventually want to end up uh, as a result of this? What's the what's the end point in this? And what, what are the boundaries within we, which we're going to work? So things like our organizational values, our, our, um, our statement of faith, um, our, our sort of non-negotiables as an organization uh, or as a church uh, will, will, will give us, will give us those, those boundaries. And we have to state those and, and be really clear, clear about that. But then within that, we can be flexible on the means. And most importantly, we need to give other people flexibility on, on the means and allow people to try different ways of, of, of getting there. So um, it's, it's really the difference between kind of assuming that our planning, that, that, that we're able to plan in a kind of rail track kind of way where we can actually lay down exactly what's going to happen in an order. And more, I don't know whether, whether this game is familiar, it's quite a popular game, particularly among students uh, in the UK, is a game called the Ticket to Ride. And the idea of the game is that you, you get given some cards that tell you uh, destinations that you have to get to. Um, and 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 then the game is working out uh, how you can get uh, to those destinations, uh, while other people are also trying to get to their destinations. But the idea is the the, the 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 key to the game is to be very very flexible about kind of seeing the end point. So you've got a you've got a start point and you've got an end point, but you in between that you've got lots and lots of different ways that you can get to that destination. And so uh, as, as leaders, what we want to do is provide people with as much freedom on the, on the, the, the kind of detailed ways of getting things done, but as much clarity as possible about the beginning, the end and the boundaries uh, within which we want to work. Now, another way this is uh, sometimes articulated is to think in terms of containers, and I mean metaphorically here. So containers are very helpful. You know, we put things in a container, they, they kind of mix up. Um, so, um, you know, if, if, you, if you put gases in a container and then depending on the size of the container, you can kind of change the rate of reaction and so on. And, um, uh, and, 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 and within that container, then those the elements interact and form new compounds and new possibilities emerge. So organizationally, what does what does that mean? What does what does a container uh, look like? Well, they they can be really quite small and light touch things, or really quite significant things. So here are a few examples. 
that uh, I, I know have been going on a lot, for example, over the past year, just a lot of teams all uh, just starting a daily check-in um, that acts as a place where people kind of share what's going on and make sense of what's just happened and, and, and so on. Um, running an organization survey brings a whole lot of different perspectives together where you can kind of make sense of how different people are thinking about a thing. Um, planning a future event can actually act as, as, a, as a survey because, uh, sorry, as a container, because um, in, in preparing for a future event, people have got to make decisions, they've got to kind of identify priorities and so on. And so it causes um, a whole lot of coming together um, and interaction um, that, that is often very helpful for, for, for bringing um, momentum in a, in a particular direction without needing to know all the detail of, of the plan. Um, asking a great question acts as something like a container. So, you know, if, for example, um, you know, at the, at the start of a lockdown, I think many church leaders were, were, were posing the question to, to their, 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 their fellow leaders and their congregations of how could we really make sure we stay closely connected with everybody in our church family during, during this time? And that question of how could we, the question that begins, how could we, um, often acts as a great container because it invites people to contribute uh, ideas and perspectives and and resources that they've got and you know well I you know we, we've just written a postcard to everybody who's in our Bible study group and you know we we sent everybody this and and we 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 organized walks in the park you know and so all these ideas came would would come together it's a really really simple um, uh, kind of example. But the idea of simple rules that can act as a container as well. But so, and by by simple rules, I just mean sort of short, memorable things that everybody can can get can get behind. So, at the start of the lockdown, for instance, for for several months into it, um, every when we were when we were first going to church online, at the end of every Sunday service, my husband would finish off by going, "Let's love one another, um, love our neighbours, and." talk about Jesus and share Jesus and that you know, he would say love one another love your neighbors and share Jesus and and th those were the three things that he just wanted to kind of keep encouraging people to do now how people did that huge amount of creativity flexibility and, and, and whatever but that was kind of saying look I'm not going to map, map out the detail of how this is going to happen but these are the things that we care about um, as, as, as a church family and so something even like a catchphrase can act as something of a container in the way I've just, just illustrated. Um, and even doing an evaluation study, getting feedback on something um, can, 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 can act as a, as, as a way of bringing together different, different points of view. So the heart of this is um, the, the idea of um, kind of leading with good, good process. You don't have to know the answer but actually what you can provide is a process in which people can bring together uh, pieces of the jigsaw. So you might have, there's this idea of sort of street corners. Everybody, you know, if, 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 if a car accident happens um, and you've got four different people standing on four different um, uh, corners of, of the street where it happened, each person will have a slightly different perspective on it or a slightly different way of illustrating this is, you know, well, in, in, in this picture here, you know, one, one person is seeing a boat and one person is, is seeing land. And actually, if you were a shark, you might look at both of them and go, that's, that's, that's my dinner, that's, that's, that's food. That's a bit, that's, that's a bit being, being a bit frivolous there. But the point is, um, bringing together different perspectives actually helps you understand um, things that you, you, when you don't know exactly which way to go, just fills out that picture. And fundamental to um, planning and uncertainty is living with the not knowing, but being in an active state of building understanding. So let me point you to a couple of other process type of type of things that 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 that, that might help uh, in relation to this. So something that has uh, shaped um, my approach to all sorts of unknown situations over the years. Um, has been uh, something that's uh, often described as a lean startup approach. The, the, the idea of approaching things rather than trying to sort of map out the whole, the whole plan and know exactly where we want to be in three years time or whatever, is to kind of go the general direction is over there. 
But what we're going to do is a series of small experiments. And as we do those small experiments, it gives us an opportunity to kind of rapidly test what works and what doesn't so that we can feed back and learn. In relation to donors, for instance, somebody talked about that as an example. You know, are, is there a slightly different way we could engage some of our donors and just see, test that out and see and feed back and learn from it? And if that works, we could kind of roll that out on a bigger scale and then we embed what works and we, we, we drop what doesn't work. So you start off quite, quite sort of simple and, and a bit tentative. And then as you see what works, perhaps a, a, a way of doing things starts to take shape so that over time you end up with something that is, that is, that is more established um, and, and, and more confidently um, approach. So there's a, there's, there's, there's a whole um, raft of resources on the lean startup concept. Um, there are other ways that that's sometimes uh, described as well in the, in the whole world of, of kind of innov in innovation strategies. But I think that can really help us as it just, just generally a, a kind of mindset and approach. So Eric Ries is the, is, is the author there. Let me let me let me share another even simpler approach. Um, some of you might have come across this if you've had anything to do with the, the world of coaching. Um, there's a very very simple model called the Grow model, which is usually used for one-on-one -on -one coaching. But I have often used this working with groups where the way forward is unclear, where where it's difficult to work out what to do, and to structure um, a, a dialogue across a group. Not, 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 not even just one conversation. This might be a dialogue that takes, takes place over, over a period of time that focuses on these four things. The goal, uh, what are we trying to achieve? The reality, what is going on? What, you know, what, what is actually happening? What, what, where are we starting from, if you like? Um, the options, what possibilities can we see uh, as, a, as a way to get there? And then the will, what have we, what have we actually got the, the, the kind of confidence, energy, will, capacity uh, to, to do? And, and, and or sometimes that W is described as a, as, as a, what, as a what next. And sometimes you, you wouldn't necessarily even go through that in a linear, in a completely linear way. So you might get to the goal and the reality and then the options. And as you're thinking about the options, you're thinking, actually, have we got the goal right? And you might loop back. But, but the point is that by having any kind of um, tool or framework, it gives you a lexicon, it gives a group of people a lexicon, it gives, it gives constructs and language that allow people to talk uh, about what is going on, allow people to, to, to share and contribute wisdom. So I've included here some examples of grow questions. These are really designed more for a, for a kind of coaching kind of conversations. But um, what I've put in red here is that actually uh, the, the, the questions the questions need to need need to point us to scripture as as, as well. So there's a great tool. It's not a, you know the, the the grow model, and there are there are a bunch of others that you could choose to, to do that. But include but but make sure we're including that a, a, a biblical worldview going going right back to to that that we we talked about. So some examples of of questions here, and I'm not going to spend. A great deal of time dwelling on these um, because actually if you go and look up grow questions online you can find all sorts of banks of um of, of these questions that are that are very easy to, to kind of borrow from and adapt um as as a way of um structuring a conversation the fundamental principle here though is um, provide provide a, a kind of navigation tool of some kind that enables people to, uh, to, to participate in a com conversation, to contribute the insights and wisdom and fears that they, that, that they have in order to chart your way through the uncertainty. So the title of the slide is really the, 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 the point I've, I've, I've been making up simple frameworks, give, give language and shape to conversations. This, um, this, this is the, the final one of these that I've just included for, for information. Um, this is a kind of combination of, of multiple different um, kind of tools and frameworks that and then you can map lots of other things onto this. But when I've been working through um, some quite complex um, business issues, um, uh, sort of un uncharted territory with people, here are some of the main, and with businesses over the years, I, here are some of the main areas that I would cover. I would cover time spent on thinking about the context and environment. Uh, allowing people to bring to the table their, their understanding of what is going on and how it's changing 
uh, over time. And you can keep revisiting that conversation because it's constantly changing. Um, uh, there, there are some great headings that you can find to, to, to help you with that. If you, any of you have worked with something called a pestle analysis, um, again, that's very easy to look up. There's lots of that around. Um, that's a great set of headings that you can borrow from to help you think about the context and environment. Pestle is political, economic, social, technological, legal, and environmental, I think. Did I say? And economic. Uh, anyway, you can you can you can look that up. P E S T L E. Um, uh, so that would give you some great headings for thinking about the context environment. And in in with you know against the backdrop of that context and environment, actually talking about our goals. What are we actually here for? What what ultimately? What's our purpose for being here? And and what are the things that we we need to be aiming to to achieve? Um, in 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 the world and given our given our purpose as as an organisation, and knowing what those goals are then enables us to think through who are the key kind of stakeholders. I hate that word, but I haven't come up with a better one. Um, who who are the, the 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 kind of partners, interested parties? What are the what are the what are the critical relationships um, that that we have? Um, and how are we doing uh, on them? To, to what extent do they do they share our goals? To what extent could they work against our goals? What's the health of our relationship uh, with with those those stakeholders? Um, you can, again, you can find some, some some great kind of generic frameworks on stakeholder analysis that that you can kind of bring bring into this if that's a big piece of the jigsaw that you need to look at. And then with all of that um, kind of uh, shaping shaping the the context um, we then get to the, the the kind of specific issues that we have to address and this is quite similar to the grow model now the sort of inner part of, of the model if any of you are familiar with Myers-Briggs you'll recognize that actually there's a strong Myers-Briggs element to the shape of this if you don't know what that is please don't worry about that it's not very important for this particular purpose but taking time to make sure that we really understand the facts of the situation uh, well can be can be very valuable and helpful. Um, so often we, we we try to get into planning and decision making without actually really understanding um, the, 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 the facts of a situation. And so bringing in facts from different perspectives and from different sources, um, uh, soft uh, soft intelligence, hard data, uh, a range of a range of different sources of, of facts. And then with that understanding, uh, we then need to to take time to generate some different possibilities. And one of the one of the traps that people fall into when they're trying to sort of plan in these kind of uncertain situations is generating too few possibilities. So not thinking kind of widely and creatively enough about the different ways of going about that. So, you know, we we kind of we can often put a lot of energy into how to how to sort of push through with the way we've always done things when actually stepping back and going, is there a completely different way? Are there different possibilities opening up here? Um, under the GROW model, the sort of option questions will often be things like, you know, what would such and such a type of person or what would such and such a type of organization do here? How, how, how might so-and-so approach this? Um, and that often helps you to bring some possibilities to, to the table. Don't be afraid of using some of the creative thinking techniques. We don't have, have time or scope within the context of this particular uh, seminar to, 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 to get into creative thinking techniques. But again, there are, there are just some great simple ways of helping a group to think about um, possibilities from, from, from different directions and, and, and sort of opening, opening up the mind. Um, to, to new ways of doing things. And then having done that, we need to go through a process of really good an, an analysis, an, an analysis and decision making, the kind of uh, the thinking, uh, the, the kind of rational thinking uh, part of um, the decision making process. We, having, having some criteria uh, is really, really helpful, which goes right back to our kind of core values and purpose. Um, and, and again, using, using decision criteria tools um, there, there are all sorts of things that are available or, or, or you, you can construct for, for yourself on, on that um, so that you get to a kind of a strongly based justifiable um, decision. 
And then what we so easily um, kind of bypass is is the kind of is the, is the buy-in. So how do we actually feel about this? The reason that's a heart shape is that, you know how do how do we actually are, are we willing to really get behind this and 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 commit to the whole thing? Um, are we are we really going to take time to to ensure that people understand and buy in uh, and 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 so on? So how how we how we get to that kind of commitment uh, before before we act? So having now that's I'm just giving you one model. Um, I think what I want to really emphasize is that there are probably dozens of different different models. Um, another one that we could have covered is something called the business model canvas, um, which is useful for some situations, it doesn't work for everybody else, for, for everybody's situation, there's probably a bunch of others that I haven't quite got, got in my mind uh, at the moment. But the point is, the point is that having tools and frameworks every let, let me say something about this from a christian point of view as well is that um we you know god is a god of order um that there are things things happen in certain ways and patterns and therefore we there is common grace um in in some of the stuff we've got to use it carefully it'll never understand our problem uh, deeply enough uh, it'll never get the beginning and the end right it'll never understand the creative potential of uh, humanity and the 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 the, the imago dei, the our, our our being in God's image, it'll never understand that deeply enough. They'll never understand the, the problem of sin deeply enough. But 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 there will always be there. There will often be quite a lot of value uh, in in these these tools and models. And so use them as far as they they help you to sort of take you along the process. Don't ever be enslaved to a particular uh, model model or tool but uh you know learn 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 to learn to use um a few different models well and, and help them to to sort of get your get your thinking and get people involved most important giving people shared language is is the thing that will help people to participate and contribute to this kind of planning planning process and then in a sense um this is what we've started to sort of move on to which is in a sense the the, the communication matters almost more more than any anything so both both what we communicate and and how um, and so in in conditions of uncertainty when 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 things are very up in the air actually communicating a, the vital few things what are the simple priorities that we help people to stay focused on and have flexibility about how they get there um, is is a, is a really helpful kind of communication uh, point and and also just trying to identify a very small number of of meaningful measures. What you know, how how we know um, what what the progress is. And this is not being about kind of overly outcomes driven or uh, overly commercial about about something. But but people knowing what are the what are the few key things that we should use to to kind of calibrate uh, how we're doing um, in terms of you know what percentage of the way towards the end point. Going back to the the, the railroad map metaphor. Um, that, that Rich was just reminding us back of, um, you know, what, what, what might be the sort of, sort of meaningful, meaningful measures um, that will help us know that we are at least making progress, even if we're having to take some detours or go a different way than we, than we expected. Um, and we've, we've just been talking about this in a way, that the how, when things are uncertain, it's really powerful to use metaphor, uh, ways of exploring and communicating meaning. So I've deliberately done that as part of uh, the conversation uh, here today, um, uh, particularly cross-culturally, although recognizing sometimes metaphors land badly when we're working cross-culturally, but but the idea of using, you know, when I talk about big bets and small bets, for, for, for instance, um, uh, that, that sort of thing, it, it instantly communicates a whole lot of meaning, and that's really, really important, even more important than usual in conditions of uncertain and therefore, we also need to be communicating often, keep repeating things um, in, in, in various different ways um, as people are sort of navigating their, their, their way through um, this uncertain territory. And we should assume much less understanding or buy-in uh, than usual, which is why the communication matters so much. And then I think a big part of our role as leaders in all of this is actually to foster community um, in, in conditions of uncertainty, belonging matters more than, than ever. But here's the thing is that um, if people feel that they belong, they feel safer. And when they feel safer, they're more willing to, to try something. 
Um, and that's exactly what we need them to be doing when, when things are, are very uncertain. So, so, so how we foster belonging actually can have a big impact on, on people's ability to, to, to sort of try and, and keep moving, moving forward. And related to all of that, just a, a very final um, bit to, to cover is just thinking that therefore, what is what is my posture as a leader? What is our what what, what might our posture be as leaders um, in in the face of uncertainty? Um, here are some polarities. We've kind of touched on them a, a little bit. Um, so so both. I want to be. I need to be both good at knowing. I've got to really inform myself, get informed, but actually have a posture of not knowing at the same time, so that I stay curious. And with that goes, I've got to be really confident about what I stand for, what we stand for, what our purpose is, and yet very humble um, about what you know, what I don't know, and 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 where where, where the uncertainty lies. And therefore, um, I'm, I'm also trying to be simultaneously both a learner and a teacher uh, all, the, all the way all the way through um, the, the, the kind of navigation of uncertainty and therefore managing my own energy and my rest. So people are looking to me to be uh, energetic, to bring to bring momentum and, and confidence and so on to to the landscape. But if I'm going to do that well, I've also got to manage my own rest uh, really well. And fundamentally, in the face of all of this, because we know that God is sovereign and gracious, we can be thankful and joyful and prayerful and hopeful uh, for the future. And one of the things I, I just love about stopping and reflecting on all of this is that um, one of the things that uncertainty does is that it helps, it, it, it reveals weakness in us to a certain extent. And actually what scripture teaches us is that we should be very grateful uh, for, for that. So this has been one of my, one of my consistent kind of go-to verses over the past year or so, in a, in a, not just because of the pandemic, but because of other significant challenges that we've been navigating uh, both locally and, 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 and more widely. Um, this, this feeling of, of weakness, um, you know, just, just feeling, not powerful at all. Um, uh, all the things I might have kind of felt confident about, uh, I just, you know, have have, have just not been uh, as reliable as as um, as as in the past. And yet, that is that is where God's glory is revealed. So, God, who said, "Let light shine out of darkness," made His light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory, displayed in the face of Christ. That hasn't changed. That is certain. But we've got that treasure in jars of clay, weak and fragile, to show that the all-surpassing power is from God uh, and, and, and not from, from us. So my, my, my hope and prayer for us is that in uh, navigating uh, all, all of this, we're not just sort of, you know, being on the ball and having lots of wonderful models and tools, but actually that it is being formational for us, teaching us to depend more, more deeply uh, on God uh, and, and enabling us uh, to, to, in our weakness, uh, allow his glory to, to be displayed. So um, that's, that's, that's where I want to pause. And there, there, just a, there are a couple of, couple of things that, that have come across, which I'll just pick up in, in a moment. Um, Rita has placed in the chat function a link to the evaluation for the session. So um, if you could if you could make sure you, you click on that, it's also in the conference app. So if you've logged into that, you'll find that uh, connected to to the session as well. So be, we'd, we'd be really grateful if you, if you would complete that. Um, Richard has said a couple of use cases from your past and how I applied tools, tools and principles. I'm trying to uh, there are just so many. Uh, this is um, I. Um, a huge amount of where I cultivated this was in relation to um, projects in UK government, um, working with, with different departments, but probably mainly in um, the Ministry of Defence, where um, defence equipment projects are very, very, very uh, complex projects, and they are um, they're planned 20 years plus in advance, so the sort of long-term planning piece is really, really strong there, but actually what comes in is operational issues. So working, for instance, uh, you know, through, through the middle of um, 
uh, the various conflicts that the UK and and, and other um, defence um, other countries have been involved in defence wise, which which can have a dramatic impact on um, you know what has been planned out for twenty years uh, in terms of um, of, of um, industrial strategy for equipment like helicopters or warships or <laughs> or whatever. Um, and uh, so, so those are those are some of the, the contexts in which in, in 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 which I was I was kind of working through this stuff. And I have to say, just a, just a kind of testimony, I suppose, is, and we could talk a lot about those actual situations. But the testimony thing is to say um, a huge part of being able to be of use in those situations came out of being a Christian person, because the recognition that. That actually my reputation wasn't didn't didn't really matter in all of this, and the my my background of kind of relating to to other people as a sister um, was actually a really important part of being able to have a kind of presence in a room of very very senior military officials st struggling with very very difficult projects and problems, um, and and so. And so it's just a, you know, it's a, it's, it's a real gift to have a Christian worldview to, 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 to kind of go in there knowing that, you know, it doesn't matter how important these people are, um, that, that I'm in Christ um, and, and we're all fallen and we're all made in God's image. And, and that's such a leveler. And so your ability to then go into those conversations and just be as useful as you possibly can be without sort of feeling your, your identity is caught up in that. Is is actually one of the most wonderful gifts uh, to to us, and so you know, I kind of plead with all of you, whatever your your leadership role is and and responsibilities and all of and your you know brilliant minds and all of those kinds of things. Actually, the most important thing is your identity in Christ, um, and that you know holding that front and center in in any of these things is is perhaps the most important thing of of the lot. So now I'm, I'm conscious we're just about out of time. It's been a long, a long afternoon and some of you going on to, to, to other meetings uh, in the evening. I'm very happy to, to, to stay around for a few minutes if anybody wants a, wants a bit of a chat. But uh, to the rest of you, please, as Rita has requested, if you could do the evaluation and perhaps I'll see you in one of the other meetings during the forum. Have a, have a great forum uh, over, the, over the next few days and feel free just to, just to kind of drop off, drop off the call. Um, uh, when, when we're done. God bless all of you. See you again, hopefully.